Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Everybody. Welcome to Syosset's Turn the Page podcast. I am Evelyn, Reader Services Librarian. I am Jessica. I'm the Community Engagement Specialist <laughs> at Syosset Public Library. And we have a very special guest today. Would you introduce yourself, please? Hello. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Polly Sampson, author of A Theatre for Dreamers. Thank you, Polly, so much for coming on. As soon as I saw this book hit the, I guess it's Edelweiss or Net Galley, whatever it was, I saw the cover, A Theater for Dreamers by Polly Sampson. That's her new book coming out. I love the cover. It is just so fabulous, showing the island of Hydra. But let me just tell everybody a little bit about Polly. She's a UK novelist and lyricist, best known for writing the lyrics to seven tracks on Pink Floyd's hit album, The Division Bell. The former journalist has written a number of critically acclaimed short stories and novels, the latest of which is A Theater for Dreamers, which is a story of discovery set against the beautiful backdrop of Hydra, the Greek island fabled for its hedonism in the late 1960s. The book was widely hailed as one of the best novels of 2020 in England. And now it will be here on May 11th. It's available on our Overdrive platform. Now Kirkus gave it a starred review and said it's an alluring historical novel and a delectable work of escapism. In the UK, it was a bestseller. It was number two on the list. And just so others, if you have not heard of Polly, she just has plenty of other novels. And her 2015 novel, The Kindness, was named a book of the year by both The Times and The Observer over in England. You can also see her her and her family have been doing YouTubes called The Von Trapp Family. And we'll get into that and talk about that. But right now we're going to talk to Polly about her new book called The Theater for Dreamers. So Polly, thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you. This is so this is so exciting. And Evelyn has been like grinning every time she met. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're we're generally wearing masks here at the library, but uh, you know, you you can tell you can tell when somebody's smiling that wide. So masked or not, every time Evelyn talked about getting ready for this interview, it was just you could tell giant smile. Very excited to speak with you. <laughs> I'm so pleased. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so please tell our audience what this lovely, lovely, beautiful covered book is all about. So um, it's um, it's a coming of age story set in 1960. Um, it's told through the wide open eyes of my heroine, who is called Erica Hart, and she um, has a, a, a very sort of stiff life in, in London to, at the beginning of the novel, in, which is a very sort of 50s life. Um, her mother has died. Her father, although no one knows what it is at that point, has a sort of post-war trauma and she needs to escape. And she, through a friend of her mother's called Charmian Clift, who was a real person, she ends up on the island of Idra, where there's a growing international community of writers and artists. Um, I mean, the one who's best known and who is also a real person, of course, is Leonard Cohen. Um, but there, there are a circle of people there. And she arrives with her brother and her boyfriend, who she's crazy about. Um, and she really learns how to be an adult in the middle of this bohemian community. Um, and is constantly looking primarily to the other women to find a good role model. What made you pick this topic? Did, were you a fan of Shaman Cliff and Leonard Cohen? Well, I was certainly, a, I'm a long-term fan of, of, of Leonard Cohen. I mean, I, you know, if we, we, we often talk about the Tower of Song and where Leonard might be in that tower. And I think he's right up in the penthouse and, you know, there's, there's nobody on the floors immediately below him. And, um, you know, he is, he is the king of song for me. 
Um, so that was actually not a huge advantage when I came to start thinking about this novel, because you're right, the person who hooked me, well, there were two things really. One was in 2014, I went to the island of Idra with no thought of writing a book, just to have a, actually after I'd finished The Kindness, I thought I'd go with my children, who were then still children, now adults. <laughs> That's how long ago I'd started writing it. Um, and um, while I was there, I found this out of print memoir by this writer, Australian writer called Charmian Cliff, who'd lived there for a decade. And her book, Peel Me a Lotus, um, had been written in 1956, long out of print. I'm delighted to say that in the wake of um, the success of this novel, it, she is now back in print, which that's is- so great. Wow, amazing. that's um, crazy. That Good job. Been, I know, that has been the, the greatest thrill of everything actually in this lockdown year was, you know, when this publisher came to me and said, we want to put her back into print. Um, but anyway, I read this book while I was there and I just fell in love with Charmian Clift. I just, I just wanted to know everything about her. So I then started researching her. And the first thing that comes up when you research her are these amazing photographs of this bohemian community. And in these photographs, which many people will know, although they don't think they do, um, she is sitting next to Leonard Cohen underneath a tree in a taverna and he's playing his first ever concert. Mm -hmm. And um, there are 1,573 in this set of photographs because a, a, a journalist called James Burke had been on in Athens in 1960 and had been commissioned to do a photo journalism story for Life magazine about this community because it was a you know it was a new thing then people going and living on a Mediterranean island it just wasn't the done thing there were you know no no mass tourism you know there weren't easy flights it was you know quite hard to get there it was a five and a half hour steamer ride from Athens in those days. Um, and so there are 1,573 of these photographs. And I looked at these photographs and I just thought, I want to be there. And how can I be there? Well, by <laughs> researching a book and deciding to go as my narrator. And so for the next few years, I got lost in a sort of labyrinth of research while forming this character of this girl who was going to go there and, you know, have the, in many ways, the time of her life. Yeah, oh, yeah, it reads beautifully, it really does. Now, the funny thing with Leonard Cohn and your husband, David Gilmore, two of my favorite all-time songs was is Hallelujah by Leonard Cohn and Wish You Were There, Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. So it's like, I mean, it just all comes together for me. It's just amazing, it's just such a fascinating thing. So how was your research for this, besides for being on the island? I, I listened to you, another thing I wanna tell our audience, she has a wonderful YouTube ch channel, Von Trapped Family. I guess you guys started that because of the pandemic. Was that what got you yes. going with that? Yes. So, so um, the research was amazing because I mean there's no great hardship in having to go to Idra a lot which I did because I the sort of writing I do I did need to experience it in every season and I mean that was not a problem yeah, nice. <laughs> you know it's a very very nice place to go and so a lot of the research I did on Idra in fact some of the book I researched and wrote in what had been Charmian Cliff's house by a wonderful coincidence of running into the person who currently had that house who just said hey if you want to come and stay use my house I'm going to be in Athens and so yeah. I wrote part of it in that house which was That's amazing so great. and um and that circle I mean the first thing I did was I identified all those wonderful young people and you know some there's some of them are famous some of them are not famous but the thing about them all is that they all had archives and many of them had children that I was able to talk to I mean most of them were dead but mm -hmm. You know, there were children, there were grandchildren, and they all had archives. Some of them had published novels, some of them had unpublished novels, diaries, letters, and they all wrote about each other. So it's a matter of sort of piecing things together and working out how they related to each other and making the story sort of flow through that those real facts. I, I tried to keep all the chronology absolutely, the known chronology absolutely as it had been. And it was like being a literary detective because you know, there have been biographies of Leonard Cohen and there have been biographies of Charmian Clift and her husband, George Johnston, and, and of um, all sorts of other people, Goran, Goran um, Tulstrom, uh, Gordon Merrick was another one of the people there. So there are, you know, there are plen there's plenty of source material, but what no one had ever done was to look at how they related to each other. So it became a sort of quite an academic exercise 
the research, but then the writing, I felt by the time I got to actually writing Erica's story, I knew those people so well um, that the writing part just was the easiest part. Um, the research was the thing that took years. And how long did it take you all together, the research and the writing? It took, I think it was six years altogether. Wow. Yeah. That sounds like such an exciting research project. I know uh, I personally love researching things and going down the rabbit hole, so to speak. But to be able to immerse yourself in like this community, wow. Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, I, I genuinely often, you know, they felt more real to me than, than, than my family at times. And certainly when I went to, I mean, the great thing about Idra, which is a tiny island, you know, it has no roads. It ha, it's, it's, I think, 10 miles long, but it only has one town that people can live in because the rest of it is mountainous. So it's this tiny place. So that, that also makes it very interesting because those people were thrown together. And it just hasn't really changed. I mean, you can look at photographs of Idra in 1960 and you can look at it now and it isn't very different. So I would sometimes get into this complete trance that I was there in 1960 and then something would happen like a cruise ship would arrive and all these kind of people would get off this tr cruise ship and I'd almost be indignant like, who are all these people? What? And then I'd have to sort of remind myself, no, this is a beautiful island and we are actually in the 21st century. And these people are, you know, they're coming on holiday and they're allowed to do that. <laughs> are know? there hotels or anything? It's it's not built up in any way, though. No. Right? They there are no high rises, no airport, okay. um, and um, no big hotels. So it's, it's just beautiful old mansions that have been turned into uh, tiny like hotels. And breakfast type. Yeah. Yeah, lots of Airbnb, of course. Right. So how do you get there? By boat? So you have to get to Athens and then you get to go from Athens to the port of Piraeus and there's a regular ferry. And in 1960, in the, you know, in the t time of my novel, it would take five and a half hours by steamer. Right. Now you can get there, hit there on a catamaran ferry that takes about somewhere between an hour and two hours, depending on how, how much diesel they've got in the engine, I think, or something. It's it must different. be a beautiful trip. It is wonderful. It. I mean, the magical moment really is when you, the when you turn the corner because the yeah. island has these long barren shoulders and you just look and it doesn't look very promising. And it's as the ferry turns the corner, suddenly there's this amphitheater, what looks like an amphitheater, because it's a sort of crescent shaped port with all the houses rising up the hill, sort of fanning up the hill like an old amphitheater, sort of sparkling white in the sunshine. And it's wow. absolutely breathtaking when you, you sold me, I'm ready, I'm, yeah. I'm there. <laughs> now the, let's talk about the cover. Is this an actual photograph, the cover or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't take it, but it is. It is. It right. is. A, I think actually, what it is, it's a rather clever. I think they've 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 managed to put two photographs together because I I don't think we tried to reproduce that photograph on either, and we can never find the angle. So we think that they've superimposed that lovely looking girl in her yellow bikini right, right. on top of a photograph of 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 the port. Beautiful. I, I love how like you you could almost smell the air yeah. when you look at that okay. cover. Yeah, it, it, I so mean, that's exactly what perfect. it's like now. Yeah, it is a beautiful island. It is a wonderful place to be, both in terms of, you know, one's imagination or, you know, if, if you're lucky, actually getting to go there, which I really can't wait to do. I mean, it's been yeah. so frustrating this this lockdown year. You know, that the book came out at exactly the moment we locked down. Oh, wow. Exactly. I mean, that was the week. <laughs> and you had that was back in England. So you had you must have had a book tour planned and yeah. everything else. So that's how the, that's how the Von Trapps um, started. So okay. what happened was um, we were going to do a tour of because there's so much to do with this book. David and I had written a new song that had yeah. sort of been born out of this book called um, called Yes I Have Ghosts, and he was going to play that. And we had other people coming to read Leonard Cohen poems, and we had this whole evening called a Theatre for Dreamers worked out, and we had films that we'd made on Idra, and my son and my daughter-in-law who both happen lucky me to be set designers had been working on this amazing set that was going to go around the country while we did this nice show that we're really looking forward to doing and then of course lockdown happened 
as they were finishing the set. So they were locked down with us. And that's why it became the Von Trapps because right. my children had been helping to make the set and finishing, you know, the paint was still wet. And then suddenly they were all locked down with us. And I got quite despondent, you know, oh, you know, great. I've worked all these years on this book. You know, I do think it's the best book I've ever written. And, you know, I'm not going to get a chance to do this wonderful show that we, we planned. And then my son, Charlie, actually, who also had a book published in this lockdown year. Oh, oh nice. He, it was his, his first book, um, which actually is out in the States. It's called Featherhood. It's a memoir. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, so Charlie, who, as you see, you know, he compares the Von Trapp. Right. And I was sort of, you know, a bit sort of, oh, boo-hoo, you know, all our plans and our beautiful set, you know, gone, gone to waste. And he said, no, 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 no. We can just do it. We can do some live streams that will cheer everybody up. Let's just launch your book as a live stream. So that's what we did. And then right. people loved it. And so we came back and we did another one. And then we just found that we were doing, you know, one a week for a little while. And very, was- I have to say, it is so entertaining. Charlie <laughs> is wonderful. Your daughter has a beautiful voice singing with your husband. <laughs> And your yeah. little granddaughter runs around and the yeah. set, you're right the set is gorgeous where is that right in your your house in a barn here um and wow. it's yeah. i mean now of course we, we you know um, we're st- we're still locked down i mean david and i actually haven't moved for a year from here oh my gosh but one thing about this set in our barn is sometimes we go and we get greek food and we go and sit in it and pretend <laughs> we've gone to the restaurant <laughs> I can't believe you guys are still locked down. You weren't open at all? Like you've been locked down the whole year? Yeah, we we just took the decision that, you know, we are in quite a lucky situation because we live in the countryside. We can walk. You know, we, we had our family locked down for most of it with us. And we just thought the best thing we can do for everyone would be to just take ourselves out of any situation where anything could be spread. It wasn't It wasn't just that we were scared of catching it ourselves. We just thought this is actually a moral position because we are in this particularly lucky situation. You know, we've got a river we can swim in here. So it wasn't that difficult to, to just take that decision. Um, and actually it's been rather wonderful. You know, you get much closer to nature, you know, you notice every new bud, every, it's just a different way of living. And I have to say it's, you know, now we are sort of getting to the end of it. D- David is now double vaccinated. I will be next month. Oh, great. You know, the, the figures are coming right down. We're feeling, you know, a bit more confident. And I guess, you know, when we're both double vaccinated, we'll go back out into the world. But it's in, it's extraordinary, really, how how little you find yourself missing. Mm-hmm. Actually, I mean, we just we just got into a different way of life, and 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 it's fine. I mean, luckily we get on well with each other, and, <laughs> and so, yeah. You, yeah. You absolutely it's, seem to have a wonderful partnership there. I, I've really, I've really been amazed by, um, you know, certain like how entertainers have sort of embraced the this the. Um, I mean, again, you know, and I, I, there's no bright side to all of the deaths and devastation, but um, like with you, with the Von Trapp family, and also uh, my husband and I started watching Staged with um, David Tennant and Michael oh, Sheen, that- which is a yeah. lockdown comedy, which is hilarious. Yeah. But it's one of those things where, you know, at first you're, you're like sick of hearing about lockdown, but then you see creatives being creative with it and bringing just a little bit of joy to those who are in a similar situation. So, I mean, that's, you know, how quickly did that, did that whole process, like, because you mentioned your son was like, let's do this. Uh, How quickly did it evolve for you all? We just, we just just rashly, I think we just had a glass of wine and said, okay, let's go and do it. (laughs) And it was a very odd thing because, you know, we've been very private until this year. So, you know, in lockdown, we became unprivate in a way, you know, we've always really guarded family life and never sort of, you know, had a real strong division between our professional lives and our private life. But because of the situation we were in and because we just did have our family here, you know, the little granddaughter and and and, and the children, it just became something where we just lost our, lost our sense of, bashfulness I suppose and and we found much to our surprise that we really after the first one which was quite nerve-wracking because having never sort of presented as a family or you know or anything like that before we then found that we just really quite enjoyed it and Charlie was such an entertaining kind of maitre d you know he yes. kept the whole thing together very good, you know. keeping it all together absolutely yeah. Very, yeah very interesting and I love seeing your little granddaughter running around that's very yes interesting. yes <laughs> 
and the dogs and havoc. I mean, in some later ones, um, I think when Charlie launched, because then we were still in lockdown when Charlie's book came out. So we had a, a sort of, again, a live stream Von Trapped launch for his book. And at his one, he decided to invite all our chickens. Oh, God. <laughs> so it was out of chaos. You know, there were chickens in front of the camera and clucking away. And it was, it's, I mean, that was one of the things that was quite nice about it was we allowed it to be chaotic. We never rehearsed. You know, the songs didn't really get rehearsed, but David and Romany, Romany, the truth is she'd had four harp lessons when she we we prevailed upon her and said there's no one else here who can play come on Romani come and play the harp and sing and you know her ambition lies in other areas I mean she actually isn't someone with with a sort of which is a pity because she's got this beautiful voice and and as it turns out she really can play the harp I mean just by some osmosis and then we discovered that she and David had this fantastic blend of their voices that I mean, we always knew that she could sing, but we'd never sort of realized just how well she would blend. And that is often a thing in families, isn't it? You know, you think about things like the Everly Brothers or, you know, often families have this wonderful the apple blend. apple doesn't fall far from the tree. That's what no, they not, say. No, not in her case. <laughs> right. That's great. So what's the song that you and David wrote for the book? What is the so song? That's a song called um, Yes, I Have Ghosts. And um, that was... As I, when I was writing the book, I came to this line, and it's something that I have Charmy and Cliff say in the book, and it's Erica, my my narrator. They're in the graveyard in Idra, and she says to Charmy, and Charmy, and do you believe in ghosts? And Charmy sort of has some secrets, and particularly a secret about someone who's alive but who she doesn't see. And I'm not going to spoil the book by 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 saying what it is. And Charmian says to her, "Yes, I have ghosts, not all of them dead." And as I typed it. I suddenly got the sort of prickle on the back of my neck and I thought that is actually a brilliant idea for a song because any of us who have any sort of relationships where there's been a rift, you know, for whatever reason, um, and I had this in my childhood when um, I had an adopted sister who sort of disappeared and that feeling always that you were going to run into that person you you know if you took a train if you looked out of the window you'd think you saw that person and it really is like being haunted and so I knew as soon as I wrote that bit in the book that as soon as I'd finished the book I was going to write a song about it so I the day I typed the end I wrote the lyric and then David was recording it he'd had luckily he'd had the fiddle player but he'd had other people booked, I mean, professional backing singers to come and finish the, the actual recording of the song and then lockdown happened. So he was also thwarted in, with this sort of project that hadn't quite reached completion, which is how our daughter ended up singing on it. Wow, that's great. So is the song out there? I mean, can we find yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, it, it, um, it's out there. Um, it's it's also, it's actually on the audio book because then what happened was... Um, the, the, the book, when it was published last April in England, started really taking off because people found that they just wanted to be on a Greek island and it's quite yeah. an immersive read and they, that people were finding that it was actually the book that gave them some sort of relief from this thing of being stuck in, you know, grey old England. And so it started to sort of gather some pace and it was in the bestseller list and, you know, I mean, it's the first time that's ever happened to me. And um, so the audiobook company were really keen to get the audiobook out, but then the actual professional actor who was booked to record it her nanny got covid and couldn't keep the children occupied so she couldn't record it so then there was this enormous panic and then they came to me and said you know could you narrate it and that wasn't something I'd ever considered because I talk quite fast and you know I just I, not something I've ever thought of doing and David said yes yes come on we'll do it we'll do it and so he set up a microphone in his home studio and we, we started recording it and then he said why don't why don't audio book companies ever put music on? It's it's such a wasted opportunity. It'd be so nice. And then he said, let me have a go at just putting a little few bits of music on. And so he put some music between the chapters and then the single, which was then finished, went on the end because it's absolutely relevant to, to, the, to the novel. And so we gave it back to the audiobook company who were sort of delighted and they created a whole campaign around this thing wow. because apparently it isn't something that gets done um, 
very much. I mean, and I think it works really well. So yes, the single is on the audio book, but it's also, you know, it's on all the usual iTunes, Spotify's and all of that sort of thing. Well, unfortunately, the audio book is not available yet here in the United States, or I would have definitely have listened to it because I love audio books. Now yeah. that I know it, I'm definitely going to make sure that it's available on our overdrive system and download it and listen to it. Sounds great. Right. Yeah, no, it was a lovely That's thing. So to great do. that you narrated it. That's beautiful. Yeah, and then of course David got into his got into his stride because he loves working, <laughs> and then he he did Charlie's audio book as well. So, oh wow! That's so, so great. Yeah, so Charlie fabulous. read his audio book, or you read? Who yeah, read no, he, he read his audio book. Yeah, that's yeah. fabulous. Okay, yeah. so now you guys are audio book narrators. Are you going to do another yeah. one? Oh, it was exhausting. And yeah. the other thing, of course, about mine. I mean, Charlie's was fine because his um, is a memoir, mm -hmm. but mine has got this international cast of characters and I'm not a trained actor. And I had to keep going back and redoing all those voices because I have them in my head so clearly. And, you know, they're, so I couldn't help it. And then, then I would sort of be doing George Johnston, who's Australian. And then everyone would say, you've made him sound like Celez Patterson. I don't know if you know who that, you know, it's like comedy Australian voices. You've got to kind of bring that back a bit. Or, you know, if you imagine having to read Leonard Cohen's, He's Canadian. Um, well, he's Canadian and he's Leonard Cohen. Yeah. And I'd be saying, yes, well, really like this. And then everyone would say, no, just read it in your normal voice. You make him sound like Eeyore. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. yeah. That's great. I'm, now I'm really excited to listen to the audiobook. Now, in one of the interviews I saw that you did, you talked about your childhood, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. Do you want to tell our audience a little bit about that? I grew up um, with quite unusual parents, I suppose, because they were both refugees. Um, but yeah, yeah. So in 1938, both of my parents were child refugees. Um, my father, I mean, separately, they didn't know each other in 1938. Um, my father was age 10 and he escaped from Nazi Germany on the kinder transport. And my mother was six and she escaped from the Japanese invasion of Shanghai where she was, my mother is half Chinese and she was, until that then she was born and brought up in Shanghai, but on the, on the, on the brink of the Japanese invasion that she was put onto a ship and brought to England um, where she ended up living in a, an orphanage. And so both of my parents had very, very strange childhoods themselves. Um, and then, but you know, for me, my, my childhood was, was, you know, fairly normal compared to what happened to them. Um, we, we ended up living, um, we, we started off in London, um, where my father was a journalist, and then eventually they sort of got sick of the rat race, and, and they ended up living in a very, very sort of wild and deserted part of Cornwall in, in, in England, um, and I think the, the nearest next town was 10 miles away and so I had quite a lonely childhood but that suited me because I really liked the company of books and dogs and horses and you know I didn't really have any need for anyone else um so I yeah I was alone a lot of the time but I think that often lonely children you know they you get imaginary friends and this is all very good practice actually for being a writer Absolutely. and I mean and I wrote endlessly of course um, but you've always wanted to be a writer I, I that's that's such a funny one because I've never I've never wanted to be a writer yeah. but I have always written okay I mean I sometimes think that being a writer I mean I don't mean to complain about something that you know it is wonderful but it does mean sitting in my shed for sort of 10 hours a day on my own and I can think that there are more sociable ways to lead lead your life than sitting in a shed <laughs> for hours every day um but I I'm driven to write I think and always have always have been so I never really became a writer I just always wrote and you know all my work you know has always been with words you know as a journalist even when I worked in publishing writing song lyrics you know I just I just do have a compulsion to write I think yeah and you do it wonderfully so thank you so oh, much yeah, thank you <laughs> are you working on anything else right now going to start writing a few more lyrics now okay. because I think it, my husband and I have always tried to take it in turns I mean, this is no longer so vital because our youngest child, Romani, has just managed to leave home. The Von Trapps have all escaped now. And oh, it's wow, okay. <laughs> for the first time ever, it's just the two of us. But we always had a thing because we had so many children. We always had a thing that one of us would be doing a project and the other one would be focusing on the children. Um, 
And now, of course, we don't have that. So we could both be working at the same time. So it's an interesting time for us. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there isn't now anything else we need to be doing. So, yeah, so I could write a book at the same time, but I do feel that the next thing I want to do, I've got a couple of songs sort of just starting to bubble up that I'd like to write. That's um, wonderful. So we'll look forward to an album coming out soon. I, th I think so. Yeah, I mean, how soon? I mean, my husband's a perfectionist. It oh, takes okay. a long time. Yeah, fine. <laughs> We look forward to anything that David Gilmore wants to put out. I'm, it's wonderful. <laughs> I told my husband and he was excited too because he's a big Pink Floyd fan. So it's very yeah. exciting. So thank you so much for being with us. This was this was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Polly Sampson. Thank we you both. So excited. <laughs> Her book comes out May 11th for everybody who's listening. It's a theater for dreamers. The book is fabulous. And the cover is, if you haven't been away, which most of us have not, it's a great escapism to go to the island of Hydra. I look forward to doing that too. So we're going to end our Turn the Page podcast. So this has been Evelyn. And Jessica. And, and our special guest. <laughs> thank you, Polly. Thank you so thank much. You so much. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Much. And I, we look forward to your book climbing our bestseller chart too. Well, <laughs> we'll do our best to get it out there. Thank you so much. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.